And the Lord appeared unto Isaac and said, Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Sons of Promise, Isaac and Jacob. Shalom and welcome to our program. I'm Miles Weiss. And I'm Catherine Weiss, and we want to welcome you back to our series, The Sons of Promise. You know, God refers to himself in the scripture so many times, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of generations. He's the God of legacy. And the Bible is full of legacy, and we are part of that legacy legacy through Jesus, our Messiah. We're going to show you in these upcoming segments the modern state of Israel and how God's Word is causing the desert to bloom through the blessing of the in, and the ingenuity of the Jewish people. It's such a multiplied blessing. Not right. only is it the blessing of Yeshua, of mm -hmm. Jesus coming through the Jewish people. God said salvation is of the Jews. Right. Yeshua said that in John 4.20. Then beyond that, if you go back to Genesis 12, where that original promise comes to Abraham, You'll read in the Hebrew, Kol Mishpechot Ha'adama U Vesaracha. All the families Amen. of the earth will be blessed. And wow, we're really going to see that today in this series as we're going to see how the technology of Israel, the blessings that are coming through Israel, are blessing your life today. So let's begin right away with our drama back in Israel. The mission to Haran had been successful. Abraham's servant had found a beautiful wife for Isaac named Rebekah. More importantly, they were leaving with the blessing of Rebekah's family. Our sister, they said, may you become the mother of thousands, of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of their enemies. It's incredible to be standing here in modern Tel Aviv and seeing this amazing architecture behind us and know that we're uh, at the cutting edge of technology, medicine, and architecture, everything modern, and yet the story begins way back in the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this began with a wedding. We're seeing that the servant has been sent out. He's been sent to choose the bride for Isaac, and the servant bowed down. He, he worshiped because he was going to fulfill the word that his master had given him because the God of Abraham had sent him out. And he's really a picture of the Holy Spirit going out and about looking for a bride for Jesus, for Yeshua. Yeah, I love how the servant wouldn't even eat or drink until he got the answer that she was going to come with him, if she was going to follow. And of course, Rebecca said yes, even after the test that the mother said, won't you stay with me 10 more days? You know, we know 10 is the, is the time of testing, right? Is, is, is known in the Bible as testing. And Rebecca continues to pass the test and to follow after what God is asking her to do. Yeah, you know, Rashi, a famous rabbi, said that the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory, left when Sarah died but then returned when Rebecca came to Isaac. Right. And it's really a beautiful picture of the, the love between Isaac and Rebecca. And Isaac's name is mentioned seven times associated with wells because the story is about wells and living water. And God's trying to point us to something regarding the living water that he brings to us when we say yes to the bridegroom of heaven, to Yeshua. Right. And we see that in marriages all the time. Yeah. You know, Miles, one of the hats that you wear is as a marriage and family counselor, yes. and you see how life and love can bring things that were dead back to life. Yes, it's really true. In fact, our, one of our helpers on this trip has been uh, an assistant to the producer who lives in the desert, and he showed us a plant that when you take one drop of water and put it on what seems to be a dead part of it, it comes to life and provides sustenance for anyone who comes upon it in the desert. And I feel like that's how you are to me, and that's how life is in marriage, that, that the helper that God gives to a man is dependent on his character in the sense that whatever a man puts into a wife is amplified. So gentlemen, I say to you that if you want to know how you're doing, take a look at your wife. If she's thriving, that's an indication of how 
you are doing before God. And really, that's what this picture is, that, that Rebecca is asking, who is this man? Who is Isaac? What's the character of this guy? Who is he? What is he going to be like? But yet, in faith, she says yes. And I want to say that there's something in that about the redemptive picture for us with the Lord. When we say yes to Him, we're betrothed, and we spend time with Him here on this earth, and then we will spend time with Him forever in eternity because of that betrothal between the bridegroom and the bride. We'll be back after this. For insightful perspectives on Israel and Bible prophecy, ask for our free monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. At levitt.com, you can read the newsletter, watch the TV program, or visit our online store. Stay current with us on social media via Facebook and Twitter. Come with us on a tour of Israel or Petra, or a cruise to Greece and Ephesus. Please contact us for more information. The death of Isaac's mother, Sarah, had left its mark on her grieving son. He had moved to the Negev. Perhaps this would be a place where the God of his father, Abraham, could fill the void in his aching heart. This is really a story of fruitfulness on so many levels. There's the fruitfulness of this marriage between Isaac and Rebecca, and then because of that, what's going to come from that is this incredible nation. Wow. Through the line of Jacob, we're going to see what was a sand dune now becoming this thriving city and blessing going out from here to all the world. They finally meet at this time, and she is veiled. Well, they meet, and, they meet, and what Rebecca does immediately when she sees Isaac, she veils herself. And have you ever wondered in a marriage ceremony why the bride walks down with a veil? Well, this is the institution. This is one of the pointing to the veiling of the bride as she comes to meet her bridegroom. You know, God wants us to be modest, but he doesn't want us to be under a shroud. He doesn't want us to be covered from head to toe and so that we don't even have a breath or even can't even keep pace with our husband. He's made us equal. He's made us to be one. And I'm so grateful for the Judeo-Christian values that he's given us through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's really good. Uh, you know, there are 67 verses about this relationship in the Bible, about Isaac and Rebecca, really giving us an idea of how important it is as a natural event, and also how important it is because it points to the relationship between the Lord and his bride here on earth. There are some elements here that are really good to note about a successful relationship, a marriage relationship. Right, right. They had parental blessing. There was mutual consent. God is at the center of it. And they, although there was love at first sight, they grew in love beyond the romance. In fact, the word that's used here is, is love that's overflowing, but has to do with commitment beyond the intimacy and the attraction, the chemistry. There's something in this that is about a long-term relationship and love that continues. Right. Maturing love, really. So it's, it's an incredible picture for us of how we're to be in our marriages, but also think about this in terms of your relationship with the Lord. You may be single. But even if you're not, think about this. There's a parental blessing on this relationship. The Father has sent the Son to you. There's mutual consent. If you didn't say yes to God, if you didn't say yes to Yeshua, there would be no relationship. He's at the center of this. We grow in our understanding of who He is. And our love with Yeshua needs to grow beyond infatuation, needs to grow beyond just the thrill of the beginning of our walk with Him into something that's more mature where we really learn how to walk by faith and not by sight. And to learn from our patriarchs, for example, Abraham is a man of altars, 
who continually came back to God at the altars, and Isaac, as a man of wells, who began to always come back to and dig a deeper well in order to meet with God and find that living water. And so this is a story about you finding that living water. We'll be back after this. Your financial contributions to Zola Levitt Ministries enable us to bring you our weekly television series, our monthly newsletter, and our website. But you may not know your gifts of funds also support other ministries that share the gospel here and in Israel through our To the Jew First Fund, Aiton Shishkoff, our man in Haifa, and the Good News Fund. We welcome your donations to Zola Levitt Ministries as we serve together until our Messiah returns. Israel, the land of God's Bible, the land of His Word. When you come to Israel with us, you'll be able to see so many of the sites that you've read about that you know are in the Scripture, the Sea of Galilee, Jerusalem. Oh my gosh, your breath will be taken away when you, when you come and when you see the holy place that God has ordained His Son to be born, died, and He will return to. We just invite you to join us on our next tour. You know, uh, one way to know about our tours and also to know what's going on here at the ministry is through the Levitt Letter. This is not just a letter. It really is a magazine. Right. It's a monthly magazine that's free to you. You can get in touch with us at 1-800-WONDERS or Levitt.com. We would love to send it to you. Get on our mailing list and you can be apprised of things that are going on in Israel, the Middle East, and really get informed about what you need to know for the days ahead. And our resource this week is one of my favorite little booklets because I wrote it. It's called An Epic Love story, Jews and Gentiles in Messiah. And it's really about the, the heart of God for bringing together a bride, mm -hmm. a bridal company for His return. It really speaks about the revelation of Romans 9 through right. 11 and what God is showing us in these end times. Well, the enemy had his 9-11 yes. with the disaster that happened in yes. New York, but yes. God has His 9-11. Exactly so. And it is the redemption and the reconciliation of Jews and Christians yes. and world revival that's going to come through this one new man. Exactly true. Now we're going back to our story where Isaac and Rebecca get to know each other in a more intimate way. And the servant told Isaac everything that had happened, how this girl had offered him drink, then given water to his camels, and how it all was a clear answer from the Lord. And Rebecca became Isaac's wife. It's just incredible that not far from here, Isaac was increased a hundredfold. And now we see, centuries later, the increase has come through the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to the entire world, as this city, built on a sandbar over 100 years ago, is now this vibrant, 
thriving city that's exporting blessing all around the world. Yeah, talk about life from the dead. This, this city is life, life, life. L'chaim, l'chaim, l'chaim. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking about cars going by, buildings being built, people being industrious. Life is happening in Israel, yes. and it's because of the blessing of God. It's because when he blesses, no man can take it away. From all over Israel, we're seeing that God is increasing the Jewish people and the blessing that comes through the Jewish people. It's just a wonderful story. Mark Twain came here, saw nothing, and now here we are a few years later, and God has done amazing things. In fact, now it's called the Startup Nation because from here, technology is being exported all over the world. Many of the things we use in our everyday life started here in Israel. God is blessing the entire planet through the Jewish people. And yet there's such opposition, such opposition to this little nation. And yet you can see life and life more abundantly coming from this place. It's just wonderful. It is wonderful, and, and I also want you to know that nations are coming to hear how we can be a nation like Israel, yeah. because the favor and the blessing is so strong on them that they have Brazilians, they have all sorts of nations coming yes. just to learn. Yeah, just last week the Italians were here, the government of Italy was here, they want to know the secrets of Israeli technology, and that's going on around the world. There's an incredible partnership between Israel and America, between Israel and other nations in how to take the innovative spirit that's here and be a blessing to the rest of the world. So from Tel Aviv, we're just so glad to be able to tell you that God is alive and he's blessing Israel, the Jewish people, and wants to bless you as well. You know, that story of Mark Twain and his seeing the land and what the land has become now is just so incredible that it's just full of life now. Everywhere you go, there's technology and medicine and just God is busting through in every hand. Well, his word is coming to pass yes. that the, all nations shall be blessed exactly. by this people group that yes. he set apart and ordained to bring forth the Messiah and the message of his plan for the earth. He, right. he desires that all nations be blessed. It's exactly. So we're on our way to my interview with Saul Singer, who's one of the co-authors of Startup Nation. And it was so gracious of him to meet with us when Shabbat was coming. Right, I got a chance to meet his daughters. Yes. It's really a blessing. Yeah, and it's just a uh, wonderful story to hear about what he's seen and how the nations are coming to learn from Israel right. about the technological breakthroughs that they're, they're experiencing. So let's go to my interview with Saul Singer on location in Israel. Yes, we talk about many different factors in the book. One of the big ones is that Israel itself, we're calling a startup, that Israel started with an idea and it took a lot of drive and determination and willingness to take risks for Israel to survive. Mm -hmm. Another huge part is the IDF, where Israelis learn about leadership, about teamwork, about sacrifice for something larger than themselves, and what a mission is, and that's so important for entrepreneurship. And another huge factor is that we're a country of immigrants. Almost everybody is an immigrant here, their parents or their grandparents, and immigrants are everywhere. You find that they're the entrepreneurs, so it makes Israel a lot more entrepreneurial. Yeah, I think that uh, it's not just transferable, the experience of the IDF, but there's something about the intangibles that you just mentioned, the sense of unity and mission and uh, necessity being the mother of invention, that, that's, that any nation can pick up. How do you see that coming forth in America? Right, well, for Israel, the story has been about overcoming adversity. Yeah. Uh, but I think there are some lessons out of Israel about how the army teaches people to be more driven. The service aspect, we talk about military service. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't have to be military service. It could be some other kind of service where you learn about leadership, teamwork, sacrifice, and you become mission-oriented. That's, I think, a message that comes from the Israeli example that's relevant to the U.S. as well. Tell our viewers something about the everyday products that we use that invented here, were invented here. Sure. In fact, one of the big partnerships is actually, we talk about Startup Nation, but it's very big companies like Intel, Microsoft, Google, Apple, it looks like, will be opening their first R&D center outside of the United States here in Israel. Uh, Intel, most of the chips that you use in your computers like the the Pentium, the Centrino, 
were designed and or built in Israel. Uh, so there's a lot of Israeli technology in your cell phone, in your computer, in the internet, in the things that run the internet, uh, all kinds of things that people use on a daily basis, medical devices and so on. Uh, but a lot of those inventions have been essentially scaled up by big American companies. So that's been a really beautiful partnership for these big American companies. It's been very important for them and for Israel. We were so blessed to speak with Saul Singer. You know, at the same time we met with him, my son was writing a research paper about technology in Israel and the connection with American business. Wow, it's such and so a blessing. It's really incredible to see what's happening with the nations being connected to Israel through technology. Yeah, and now we're going to have uh, Mark Levitt again is going to be interviewing one of our benevolent funds, which is the tree planting. It is so important. What God is doing in Israel is to reforest this land yeah. through people people coming and planting trees. I yes. mean, there was this one beautiful woman that came and brought her grandson, yes. and she came for the sole purpose. She, she'd been coming five times to Israel with Zola Levitt, and she wanted to return to plant a tree in the name of her husband, yes. who's gone on in, to heaven, and it was a wonderful, just a poignant time for her. It really was a time of closure. Right. You know, I grew up sending funds to Israel for planting of trees. All Jewish kids around the world have participated in that. Mm -hmm. And now we as believers get to do it as yeah, well. We I think there are entire forests that have been planted through Zola Levitt Ministries. And it's needed. It is. It is. And you know, we're going to see an interview between, with Mark Levitt and Zev Kadim. He's the resource director for the Jewish National Fund. So let's go to that interview on location in Israel right now. Well, the Israelis are famous for, as the Bible says, making the desert bloom. And I understand in the Negev, in the desert, you're planting trees with so little rainfall. How do you do this? This is uh, almost a miracle because uh, I think we are the only country in the world that has much more trees now than in the past. And we are also planting in the, ne in the desert. How do we do it? We take an arid area and we kind of create small walls of soil so the moment there is a little amount of rain that goes to the ground it kind of collects the water and the tree that's being planted right at the center will get much more water than the, the, it should get uh, from the rain so we collect the water we gather the water and the trees in the desert that we are planting can survive only because of this system we, we collect the little amount of rain into kind of small dams and pools, and it provides much more uh, amount of water for the trees, and we succeed to grow trees in an area that is an arid area, and I don't think there is another place in the world that this system is so developed as in Israel. Well, it's a sign of your progress, the Jewish National Fund, that, that you can take your resources to the desert because apparently you've caught up uh, with replanting the trees that were cut by the Turks when they were trying to minimize the property taxes they paid. But also you explained there were a lot of trees cut to fuel steam engines for locomotives. Yes. Who did that and when was that? That was right before the First World War. That was around 1915. Mm -hmm. The Turks uh, needed to fuel their locomotives. Mm -hmm and the only fuel that they had was the trees of the country. Mm -hmm. So they would pay a lot of money for people to cut the trees and to bring them to central places where they will, will take them and put them on the trains and uh, fuel their locomotives. And this is practically the main reason for the situation that the country almost has no natural uh, plantation and natu natural trees. Uh, most of the trees and all of the trees that you can see around us are hand planted. Each of them was planted by someone mm -hmm. with a donation of someone. Mm -hmm. So whenever you give a donation for trees in Israel, this is the result. And the result today is all over Israel. And as you mentioned before, also in the Negev, in the desert of Israel. 
I love watching that interview between Mark and Zev Kadim because you really get a sense of the profundity of the reforesting and the bringing back to life. You know, remember that, that Israel was a land of milk and honey, and it was only over time through neglect mm -hmm. and the, the, the displacement of the Jewish people that it became that barren land that Mark Twain spoke of in the 1860s with the Turkish involvement there through the Ottoman Empire and the taxes they put on the trees and the way it was deforested. And now God's bringing it back in fulfillment of his scripture. Isaiah 35 says that the desert will bloom like a rose. Right. And it, it we're is seeing blooming. that. It, it is so wonderful yeah. to be part of that, that yeah. our donations go to planting trees. Yes. And I know that you and I have planted trees in our son's names yes. and in your mom's name, yes. who's gone on to heaven. Yes. And it is such an important uh, thing to do for Israel. They are so yeah. grateful. Yeah. And you really see the connection between the, the flourishing of the land mm -hmm. is mirrored spiritually in the spiritual flourishing mm -hmm. that's been Begun, mm -hmm. You know, God wasn't waiting for us to come back all together mm -hmm. spiritually. He said, first he'll bring us in the land and then he'll sprinkle pure water on us in Ezekiel. And he's see, we're seeing that begin to happen with the messianic remnant all being coming alive and, and the preparation for his return, for the coming of Messiah. It's all connected to what began with Abraham, mm -hmm. began in the heart of God mm -hmm. and is continuing through Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, through the covenant line and really coming into our day. Mm -hmm. and and we see it with our own sons. Yes. We see it with the young people. I'm looking forward to some of the upcoming programs. We're right. going to be interviewing some of the young people in Israel. Mm -hmm. And wow, they're just, they're just wonderful kids. Mm -hmm. So until we see you next time, we want to always remind you, please, Shalu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our resource on this program, an epic love story, Jews and Gentiles, One in Messiah by Miles Weiss. This booklet answers some questions you may have on issues like, is Jesus coming soon? How did the church lose its Jewish identity? What is the shared destiny of Jews and Christians? An epic love story takes you into the heart and the mind of Paul's writings to the Roman church. Contact us and ask for an epic love story. Our monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter, is free and full of insightful articles and news commentary from a messianic perspective. Visit levitt.com to find our newsletter, along with current and past programs, our television schedule, and much more. Your donations to Zola Levitt Ministries help these organizations bless Israel. Please remember, Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.